for. But great, thank you for the great introduction. Thank you for the great event. Thank you for all of those brave souls that survived it so long to attend the last session. So thank you very much. Um, I will present to you a little bit about uh, the status and the conditions currently in the Nordic region and try to reflect a bit about uh, this situation. I'll be available afterwards if anybody has further questions. But um, I'd like to start by saying where I'm coming from. And where I'm coming from is teaching entrepreneurship since 2003, more or less, and seeing a lot of great ideas, hundreds, maybe thousands of business plans coming into reality, trying to supervise a few uh, dozens of them through mentorship to see what will happen through that, but very few actually mature to become ventures or startups. And then we try to see why is this happening, and a lot of it is because of really chronic shortage of access to early stage finance in the Nordic country, especially in Norway, which, this, uh, which is where I'm coming from. So the situation today in terms of crowdfunding, and here's a nice slide for you, is actually a decline in the Nordic countries in the last year. But this is uh, really a superficial decline and not a real decline. And this is because all of you may, might have heard about the case of TrustBuddy, these uh, peer-to-peer lending that went bankrupt because of misappropriating and using lenders' money. Uh, lenders money. That uh, caused a certain uh, roar and a certain problem, but also its withdrawal from the market took out close to 100 million in, uh, in volume from the market. So if you would add that 100 volume that, uh, that is currently missing, then we have continued growth. All in all, with this type of scale, we're talking about 2% of the European crowdfunding market. So this is really small. And if you think this is small, when I started with the Nordic Crowdfunding Alliance, it was microscopic four years ago. Hardly anybody knew what crowdfunding is, and if they heard anything about it, they just said Kickstarter. That's all they knew. So things have been progressing. And here you can see it by division into the different types of, of crowdfunding, and you see that the biggest lump is indeed with the peer-to-peer -peer consumer lending, while all other categories have seen significant increase. Now, we've been the partners with Cambridge University in collecting data in the Nordic context, and these are some of the slides from that. The champion, or the current champion in crowdfunding in the Nordic countries is Finland, uh, closely followed by Denmark, and then comes uh, Sweden. Sweden has been at the top when TrustBuddy was still in existence. But today, this is the condition. And, and Finland has been a real leader here, not only in terms of volumes, but also in terms of attitude. You know that uh, this summer, uh, the government of Finland has approved a, a National Crowdfunding Act, actually. And that means that many things have been clarified, but have, haven't been made easier, but at least clarified. And that's a good step forward. And some of our purpose is also to get to, into some harmonization. In Iceland, you see uh, only 0 0.8 million uh, in, in total volume. But this is still quite high for the population when you think about it. A population of 300,000, and especially in a context of post-trauma from the financial crisis. Norway? Way behind, very small, and I have a whole lecture to talk to you just because why are we so bad at this? But I'll save it to you, and if you want to ask as part of the follow-up questions, I can take that. Why is Norway so low? In terms of average volumes, at the equity side, we see around 120,000 euros. Um, at the peer-to-peer -peer lending business, 93,000 euros and that the reward close to 6,000 euros. And that's including the big international uh, platforms like Kickstarter and Indiegogo. The local platforms see lower volumes. The big problem, surprise, surprise, not, uh, this is from last year, but uh, also this year, basically says that regulation is not in place. Some of you may point and say, yeah, but 40% say, regulations are adequate or there's no need for additional uh, regulatory change. 
But the truth is that those 40% are the reward and donation platforms that don't need much <laughs> updates in terms of regulation. All the platforms that are unhappy with existing regulation is peer-to-peer -peer lending and equity. So this is a bit of a twisted uh, image, and if we will separate it by crowdfunding type, we will see uh, different results. When I started in 2014 with the Alliance, this is more or less was the market and the, and the actors that operated then. And this is how it looks today, plus an additional one in Sweden. Beneath the surface, there's also a bubbling of new platforms or entrepreneurs with the aspiration to start up new platforms. And I hear about them and hear from them all the time. So I expect a lot more to emerge and to rise. The Nordic Crowdfunding Alliance, which is uh, actually state-funded or state-sponsored association, collaborative effort between platforms across the Nordic countries to work together, share information, educate the market, and lobby to the extent possible for harmonization of, uh, of legalization. These are the members that are currently members. The original five were Mesonati, an investor from Finland, Karolina from Iceland, Bidra from Norway, and Boomerang from Denmark, and new ad two additional platforms joined in the last years, and others I know are interested in doing so as well. So all in all, these platforms have, are responsible for around 12 million euros in raising, 9 million through reward, uh, sorry, through equity, and another 3 million through reward. So it's still not big volumes, and even that is just 10% of the Nordic market. So we hope to, to expand the circles, cover more grounds, and be able to, to represent people even further. But at the same time, if we look at it from a community perspective, then we have 100,000, more than 100,000 users of these platforms, and 30,000 of them are quite active or repeated users. So there is a community to definitely build on into the future. The Alliance itself is committed to education work. We arrange events such as this in every country in the Nordics, reaching out, educating the markets, involving stakeholders, and creating interesting discussions. We do, uh, we, we try to develop a community. We came up with the idea of a Nordic campaign. So if you register a campaign on any member platform, and you wish, and you ch check that you wish to, to, to be Nordic, it will be distributed and presented on all member platforms, and in that way you have a wider reach into other markets that maybe otherwise you don't need to invest in entering, at least at this stage when you have limited resources. The Alliance members themselves, they meet every uh, half a year physically and every month by Skype, exchange, update, share information, and solve problems together, and we also share information towards the market following this. We engage in public debates, media contributions, uh, events that we arrange, education seminars, and invited to consult uh, different authorities from time to time. And of course, being from the university, I'm very interested in research. I'm using this opportunity to gather as much data as I can, and we had quite an ambitious data collection effort from all these uh, members of the community this summer. So let me give you some more details about the platforms, because I think we're missing a little bit the facts behind platforms. So here are the original member platforms, and you can see these are the numbers of total successful campaigns since more or less 2013 to 2015, and the success rates. And you see there's big variety here. I mean, Carolina, the Icelandic, are really champions in this, close to 80% success rates. You would ask, how come? I have a few explanations to that. One is relatively modest goals when you compare to other platforms. Okay, so they don't really go a lot above uh, more than a few thousand euros. But also, there's a movement in Iceland that is very anti- uh, traditional banks. So anything that just smells of alternative finance, they're in favor of. And therefore, there has been a great uh, response to, to crowdfunding there. In uh, the, the youngest platform, Bidra in Norway, there you see also the lowest uh, success rate, 
But even there, when you come to think about it, where else in the world will you have a chance of one to three to get the money you need? I mean, we really underestimate the value of crowdfunding. And you know, much of the 70% that didn't get that funding are crappy campaigns. Let's be honest about it. So if you do a good campaign at this stage, at this level of maturity of the market, you're very likely to, ha to have a success. And this is what I'm trying to convey throughout the dialogue. Investor is a different category. Uh, Lassa earlier presented you somewhat different numbers because of it's a different period. But 40% success rates in equity, I think, is also very good, especially when the average is around 156,000 euros. These are the best campaigns so far on each of the platforms. We see that at the reward uh, type platforms, around 50,000 euros. But as you can see, it's quite a wide variety of industries, counter to what we may expect. So in Denmark, it's been a smart GPS tracking for bicycle. In Norway, it's been a fashion brand. In Iceland, both these campaigns have been media or newspapers. And the biggest one, the 100,000 euro ones, is the journalists that expose that the prime minister have accounts in uh, in a tax haven, uh, which led to his resignation right a few, uh, few days later. On Mesonati, both best campaigns are museums with, that raised 85,000 euros. And on uh, B, B, uh, an, an Investor, both uh, top campaigns are actually from logistics, maintenance, storage, not the, the, the industries that would immediately jump to your head. In addition, I must say that the investor itself raised 1.2 million for themselves through the same mechanism. When we look into where does the money go to in terms of sectors at the reward uh, type of products, we see, surprise, surprise, 37% goes to music, entertainment, film production, and so on. Social and political initiatives, including pol small political parties that are trying to raise uh, funding through this. Production of books and magazines, and lifestyle, leisure, and sport. At the equity side, we see a different type of sectors. We see more technology-oriented, more high-knowledge-intensive industry, we see 25% going to software and app development, 14% to lifestyle, leisure, and sports, including football clubs, biohealth and medical services and technologies, and consumer goods. But we always talk about the positive things, and here I want to highlight what we do to try to deal with the negativity that uh, we also feel from the market, and probably you do so all the time. So first of all, I, I don't know if you've heard much of such statistics, but a lot of campaigns are rejected. Even though when we log in and we see these campaigns and we're not very impressed, this is after the filtering. So 55% on average are rejected from reward type platforms, and up to 80% are rejected from equity type. So there is a certain self-governance, self-filtering, effort by the platforms that should not be underestimated. The main reasons could be either uh, purpose, all sorts of moral, unethical, socially problematic issues like the Nazi party trying to raise funds through crowdfunding. It could be all sorts of dubious claims by people that are unsubstantiated. They say they have a cure for this or that without the proper documentation. It could be goals that are just unrealistic, all sorts of uh, I'm not sure what they've been smoking, but really out of this world evaluations of companies or very high target sums. And sometimes it's just that the project manager just logged in and never finished or not really engaged, not committed, not fully into the process. So we have developed a small code of ethics that we're trying to follow to the best of our uh, capacity. The three first points are that we commit to provide information about the services, the costs, there's no hidden fees, no surprise payments, and so on, very clearly on the websites. We have committed to due diligence and authentication process of each campaign that is registered, and to allow only campaigns that are in accordance with national laws. 
We also are committed to filtering practices uh, for avoiding publication of misleading information and to secu best security practice. The most problematic point here is to accept campaigns where campaign owners are actively engaged. Okay, I will jump from here and just will give you a few uh, last uh, reflections. One is, I think the trend is that we will move away from a technology focus, developing the best technology we can to the platform, to more community focus. Because at the end of the day, this software can be bought off shelf. Our real assets as platforms is a community. The other point is the movement from idealistic hipster and activist people who establish these platforms to more professional management of platforms. International expansion, especially from platforms from small home markets, ongoing rise of equity crowdfunding, and the rise of niche platforms like real estate and renewable energy, consolidation of small platforms, regulatory amendments, especially uh, exclusion laws from prospectus and license, special license categories for P2P lending, crowdfunding education moving mainstream, increasing professionalism of campaign management, and the, crowd co and the crowdfunding campaign support industry will boom. All those guys and advisors that currently haven't had much business in helping entrepreneurs making a campaign, this is definitely going to be a success, especially in the equity side where we're talking about large volumes. I hope uh, this has been uh, interesting and informative enough for you. I welcome uh, your questions. Thank you. Thank you.